Larry Bird retired after the 1992 season, signaling the end of one of the greatest eras of Celtics basketball. The torch was passed to Reggie Lewis to carry on the tradition, but his tragic passing before the 1994 season prevented that from happening. Then, in 2007, the Celtics made two blockbuster trades to form a big three that took them to six straight playoff appearances, three conference finals appearances, two NBA finals appearances, and a championship in 2008. But between that period, for five years and some change, the Celtics had one of the highest scoring duos in the league, consisting of Antoine Walker and Paul Pierce. Walker and Pierce spent five years in the late 90s and early 2000s, taking turns as the Celtics' first and second leading scorers each season, as well as a brief reunion a couple years after their original partnership had ended. They wouldn't make a playoff appearance until their fourth season together, but they would produce some memorable playoff moments when they did get there, such as one of the best comebacks in postseason history. But as soon as they seemed to be gaining traction, they were broken up, and when it comes to Boston, they measure their success on rings. And while they both eventually got a ring, they didn't in their time spent together. And today, their contributions seem to be overlooked, as they were sandwiched between two great eras of Celtics basketball. So let's take a deeper dive into the duo of Antoine Walker and Paul Pierce. Antoine Walker was the first of the tandem to arrive in Boston, as he was selected 6th overall in the legendary 1996 NBA Draft by Boston. Walker played just two seasons for Rick Pitino in the University of Kentucky, but made his mark during that time, as he was named SEC Tournament MVP as a freshman, and then named to the All-SEC First Team, All-SEC Tournament Team, and All-NCAA Regional Team as a sophomore. A sophomore season which saw Walker help lead a dominant Kentucky team to a national championship, winning by single digits only twice throughout the tournament. And Walker would finish second on the team in scoring in the regular season and for the tournament of his sophomore year. Walker would go on to play all 82 games for the Celtics his rookie year, leading the team in points and rebounds per game, en route to a selection to the all-rookie first team. But the team had its worst season in franchise history, finishing at 15-67. and 67. The 98 season would see the Celtics become an extension of the 96 Wildcats. As Patino was hired to coach the Celtics, they drafted Walker's college teammate Ron Mercer in the 97 draft, and then traded for another Kentucky teammate, Walter McCarty, in October of 1997. Walker would have arguably the best season of his career, as he would play all 82 games, average a double-double for the season, and add a career-high 49 points in a January 7th loss to Washington. His performance was good enough to earn him his first All-Star selection, as well as landing him on the cover of NBA Live. However, the Celtics still finished 36-46 and 46 and missed the playoffs. They would make a solid acquisition this season, as they traded for point guard Kenny Anderson. Going into the 1998 NBA Draft, the Celtics had a 6-7 small forward from Kansas fall into their lap at 10 someone that Walker would say was not supposed to fall to them. And it's understandable that Pierce falling to 10 was a surprise, as he was coming off a three-year college career that saw him win two Big 12 Tournament MVP awards, get selected to the third team All Big 12 in his sophomore year, and the first team All Big 12 in his junior year, as well as a consensus first team All-American in his junior year. And Paul Pierce would do this as a three-year starter on a team that made three straight tournament appearances, in which he averaged over 16 points for his Kansas career. 1999 was a lockout shortened season, and prior to the season, Walker was signed to a massive six-year, $71 million extension. The 50-game season also looked like it would allow Pierce to ease into the league at a good pace, but he didn't seem to need to do that. As much like his third-year teammate Walker, Pierce would be selected to the all-rookie first team, as he was third on the team in scoring and first in steals per game. And Pierce started the season on a tear, as he scored 19 or more points in 10 of his first 11 games to start the season. Walker would start the season on a similar tear, as he would score 14 or more points in 21 of the first 22 games of the season, with 12 of those seeing him score at least 20. But a late season injury would sideline Walker for 8 of the final 10 games of the year, which saw the Celtics go 3-7 and seven in those games, finishing at 19-31 and 31 and missing the playoffs. It didn't help that both Pierce, Walker, and their second leading scorer Ron Mercer all shot below 44% for the year, with Walker shooting a career low in seasons that he was a regular starter. Overall for the season, Walker would average about 18.5 points, 8.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game, while Pierce would average about 16.5 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. The 2000 season saw scoring improvement from both Walker and Pierce. Walker would play in all 82 games and bump his scoring average back up to over 20 points. However, even though Walker possessed an ability to get to the basket and a great post game, one of his main selling points coming into the league was his ability to stretch the floor with his long-range prowess as he was ahead of his time in that regard. But what could be frustrating at times was that Walker didn't have the best shot selection, and his field goal percentage would suffer because of that. 
but his three-point percentage in particular suffered this season, as he took three and a half threes per game, but had the worst average of his career at 25.6%. Pierce's second year would see him start the year off strong, with a 30-point opening night, and scored double digits in 69 of the 73 games he played in. Pierce was beginning to show the ability that would see him take over as the team's number one option, as while he didn't shoot exceptionally better than Walker this season, he still shot better in all categories, specifically free throws, as Pierce would shoot nearly 80% from the line and continue that trend for the remainder of his career, while Walker would shoot below 70% and would also continue that trend for the majority of his career. Kenny Anderson also provided a good third option for the team, as he averaged 14 points to go along with 5 assists per game, but the Celtics defense was lacking, and they finished 35-47 and 47 and missed the playoffs, marking another underachieving season for Patino. This season was memorable though, as it marked the last game on the legendary 53-year-old Parkwet floor, when they beat Atlanta on December 22nd, a game that Pierce didn't play in, but Walker led all scorers with 24. And for the regular season, Walker would average about 20.5 points, 8 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game, while Pierce averaged about 19.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game, while also averaging 2 steals for the only time in his career. About a month prior to the 2001 NBA season, on September 25, 2000, Pierce was stabbed 11 times and bottled at a Boston nightclub. Pierce was saved by Celtics teammate Tony Batie and Batie's brother, who were with Pierce at the club and rushed him to the hospital, where he underwent surgery to repair damage to his lungs. This would be a scary incident for anyone to experience, and you'd think they may need to take a significant leave of absence to recover physically and mentally. But not Pierce, as he would be the only Celtic to start in all 82 games this season, and was second on the team in minutes at over 38 per game. Additionally, the 2001 season started with Patino at the helm, but after a 12-22 start, he resigned and was replaced by Jim O'Brien. On top of Pierce playing in every game, he raised his scoring average to a then-career high to become the team's leading scorer marking the first time that Walker didn't lead the team since he was drafted. But Walker wasn't far behind, as he averaged a career high in points as well. O'Brien wasn't able to save the team, as they went an extremely average 24-24, finishing at 36-46 and and missing the playoffs again. It was becoming frustrating that the Celtics weren't winning or making progress, but a major issue with these Celtics was that it was basically Pierce and Walker versus the NBA, as Anderson only played in 33 games, and the team's third leading scorer was Bryant Stiff who averaged less than 10 a game. Even though Walker set a career high in scoring, his shot selection was subpar, as he shot just over 41%. A couple bright spots for Walker was that he raised his three-point average to nearly 37% and shot over 70% from the free throw line for the first time in his career. Pierce and Walker would also both have 40-point games this season, as Walker had a 47-point game in a January 17th loss to Sacramento, and Pierce had eight 40-point games throughout the year. For the regular season, Walker averaged about 23.5 points, 9 rebounds, and 5.5 assists per game, while Pierce averaged about 25.5 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Pierce also earned his nickname of The Truth after a March 15th victory over the Lakers that saw Pierce score 42 points on over 68% shooting. The 2002 season started without great expectations after the previous year, and even though they had 3 picks in the 01 draft, it didn't look like the Celtics had really hit the mark with any of them although one would later develop into a star, just not for them. But the Celtics surprised everyone, as at the All-Star break they were 28-21 and 21 and very much alive in the playoff race, and they were also sending two of their own to the All-Star game, as both Pierce and Walker were selections. Pierce is first and Walker's second. And Pierce would play great, scoring 19 points, while Walker would chip in eight of his own. Anderson would also play 76 games and do a good job facilitating the offense of a team that went 21-12 and 12 after the All-Star break to finish 49-33 and 33 and enter the playoffs as the three seed, the first playoff appearance of Walker and Pierce's career. Round 1 would see the Celtics face Allen Iverson and the defending Eastern Conference champion 76ers in what would be a hard-fought five-game series that saw the Celtics pull it out in the series deciding Game 5, behind a playoff career high of 46 points from Pierce. Pierce and Walker were both great, as Pierce averaged over 30 points and 8.5 rebounds, while Walker averaged about 24.5 points and 8 rebounds. Round 2 would see the Celtics face the Pistons in what would be a great showing, as after they dropped Game 1, the Celtics would win 4 straight to advance to the Conference Finals. Pierce and Walker didn't dominate offensively against the Pistons like they did against the Sixers, as Pierce averaged 10 less points per game, including going 2 of 23 from 3 for the series, while Walker averaged 5 less, but did score his playoff career high of 30 in Game 4. However, 
the Celtics made up for it with their defense, as the Celtics never allowed more than 81 points in any of their four wins, including a Game 3 win that remains the lowest total points in a playoff game since 1954. The Eastern Conference Finals would see the Celtics matched up with the New Jersey Nets, a team that the Celtics had fared well against during the regular season as they went 3-1 against them. And Pierce was also very confident in his abilities and the Nets' inability to stop him. And Nets coach Byron Scott agreed with this to some degree. The Nets and Celtics would split the first four games with the highlight of this series being the Celtics coming back from being down 21 points in the fourth quarter to win game three and take a 2-1 series lead. And the Celtics were feeling good about their chances, as prior to this comeback game, they had won game two as well, even though Pierce had shot three of 20 from the field that game. But in game four, and down by two points with just over one second left, Pierce went to the line to tie the game, but he would miss the first free throw. And then he would deliberately miss the second free throw. And even though Batie got the rebound, he couldn't make the putback layup. The Nets then won game five, and then unfortunately in game six, while down 3-2, Pierce and Walker couldn't find their shot when it was needed most, as they combined to miss 8 of 9 shots in the 4th quarter of their season-ending loss. Pierce and Walker scored well, as they both averaged over 22 points per game, but their efficiency was the issue, as they both shot below 39%, and Pierce shot an uncharacteristic 68.4% from the free throw line. So, although it was a heart-wrenching way to end the season, the Celtics finally had made noise in the East, as Walker and Pierce were entering their prime. So the future looked bright. And for the regular season, Walker would average about 22 points, 9 rebounds, and 5 assists per game, while Pierce put up a then career high 26.1 points, which was good for third in the league, about 7 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Pierce would also be voted third team All NBA. 2003 started out great for the Celtics, as after dropping their first two to start the year, they would win 10 of their next 12, and by the All Star break, they were 27 and 22. Walker and Pierce were both voted to the All Star game for the second year in a row where Pierce would score 8 and Walker would score 6 in what would be Walker's final All-Star game. Tony Delk was serving as the team's starting point guard this year, as he had come over mid-season the previous year in a trade that had sent Joe Johnson to the Suns. Delk was the starter as Anderson had been traded to the Sonics for Vin Baker, which proved to be a horrible trade for the Celtics as Baker was a shell of his former self. Delk also battled with injuries this year, which led to J.R. Bremer taking over the point guard duties for a lot of the season. As was the common theme for Walker and Pierce's time together, they each averaged over 20 and didn't get much help from the rest of the team, as Delk was the next closest at 9.8 points per game. The Celtics were able to make it back to the playoffs with a 44-38 record, but unfortunately could not replicate their run from the previous year. The Celtics would face the Pacers in the first round in a series where Pierce would be the top scorer at almost 26 per game but he would shoot under 39% and it would be Walker who would be the more efficient of the two as he shot nearly 46% and over 43% from three to average 19 and a half per game. The Celtics also got solid contributions from a healthy Delk and Walter McCarty. The Celtics would win the series in six games where Pierce would drop 40 in game one and 37 in game four. Game four was also the game where Pierce famously trash talked with Al Harrington as he dribbled out the clock to end the third quarter before hitting a sidestep three. The Celtics ran into the Nets again, this time in the second round, but the rematch of last year did not go as expected, as the Nets made quick work of Boston and swept them. The Nets trio of Kidd, Martin, and Jefferson played great in this series, as they out-hustled the Celtics, leading to a second chance points and free throw advantage. Pierce did all he could, as he averaged about 29, 8, and 8, but this would be the first series in their time together where Walker wouldn't be a top two scorer on his team as Delk was second and Walker averaged just 14 points on about 34% shooting and 20% from three, as Kenyon Martin played lockdown D on him. This would, however, be the only playoff series of Walker's career where he would average a double-double. So, this ended the 0-3 season for the Celtics, and after Danny Ainge was hired as the team's new GM, the writing was on the wall for the end of their high-scoring duo. But for the regular season, Walker averaged about 20 points, 7 rebounds, and 5 assists per game, while Pierce averaged nearly 26 points, 7.5 rebounds, and 4.5 and assists per game, and received another third-team All-NBA selection. Ten days before the start of the 2004 season, Walker and Delk were traded to the Mavericks in exchange for Rafe LaFrenz, Chris Mills, and Yuri Welsh. Part of the reason for the trade was that Walker's massive contract was up at the end of the 04 season, and he wanted another big extension, which Ainge didn't want to do, even though LaFrenz had five years and $50 million left on his contract. Another probable reason for Walker being dealt is that Ainge just didn't like his game, as he would say when he was a TV analyst. So, Walker spent the season in Dallas, 
playing for the best offense in the league and second worst defense, and had a respectable year for a disappointment of a super team, as they would lose to the Kings in the first round. Pierce would still be in Boston, and while he had another all-star season, the rest of the team left something to be desired, and they would only finish with a 36-46 and record, which surprisingly got them into the playoffs as an 8 seed, where they were swept by a great Pacers team. Walker and Delk would be traded again in the 2004 offseason, this time to the Hawks for Jason Terry, where Walker would average over 20 points in his 53 games with Atlanta. The Celtics had traded for Gary Payton prior to the 05 season, and Ricky Davis was playing a crucial sixth man role for Boston. And near the trade deadline, while the Celtics were 27 and 28, they would trade Payton to the Hawks to reacquire Walker and reunite him with Pierce. Payton would also be bought out by the Hawks immediately and return to the Celtics a week later as a free agent. Walker added some much needed scoring, which helped the Celtics go 18 and 9 the remainder of the year. Walker also began his time in Boston as number 88, as rookie Al Jefferson was wearing his usual number 8. But after two games, Walker had number 8 and Jefferson had switched to 7. The Celtics would play the Pacers in the playoffs again and would lose in 7. However, it probably wouldn't have been as close of a series if Ron Artest hadn't been suspended for the year. Walker would make consistent contributions for the Celtics in these playoffs, as he was second on the team in scoring and even had a team leading 20 points in their Game 7 loss. Walker would only play 6 games this series, as he was suspended for Game 4 after grabbing a ref during a confrontation with Jermaine O'Neal in Game 3. Pierce would struggle from 3 in this series, but would shoot well from the field, and for his time spent with the Celtics, Walker would average about 16.5 points, 8.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game, while Pierce had yet another all-star season, averaging about 21.5 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. And this would be the actual end of the duo, as Walker was involved in a massive five-team trade in the offseason, which saw him end up on Miami, where he'd win a championship as a key role player. He would spend another year in Miami, then a year in Minnesota, a few months in a Puerto Rican league, and then two years with the Idaho Stampede of the NBA Developmental League, before hanging them up in 2012. Pierce would enjoy a Hall of Fame career in Boston that would see him get his own ring in 2008, after the formation of their Big Three. Pierce would have his most postseason success during his final six years in Boston before finishing his career with stints on the Nets, Wizards, and Clippers, retiring as a member of the Celtics in 2017. So it's not so much that these two are forgotten players by any means, but they formed one of the better duos of their time who just didn't have the team success that was hoped for, which unfortunately seems to see them slip through the cracks sometimes when talking about Boston basketball. With that being said, Danny Ainge probably made the right decision when he traded Walker initially as Walker did not have the best shot selection and as the years went on, seemed to take his fitness less and less seriously. But as Walker said when talking about training with Michael Jordan before his Wizards comeback, Walker was a hooper. He didn't really care about the weights and stuff. I think the special thing about this duo is how well they got along. As Walker says his best NBA relationship was with Paul Pierce. These two seemed like they could have stayed together for years and it wasn't conflict that drove them apart. It was just the business. But maybe it's a good thing they were broken up when they were as more years without success may have led to a messy break instead of the end of something that leaves you with positive memories and wondering if they could have figured out a way to put it together. But I'll let you go as this has been a long episode about one of my personal favorite duos. Thanks for taking the time to watch and subscribe for more. Also, check out the Disregarded Duos playlist to see the other episodes, and I'll see you next time.